Okay, so welcome to lesson six, where we look at lipids. Uh, and the reason why I wanted to do these two lessons so close to each other is because you'll start to see some similarities in terms of how that uh, organic chemistry components are so important, because you'll start to see how those reactions are consistent regardless of the type of molecule, uh, biological molecule we're looking at. So when you look at lipids, it's important to recognize that these are going to be larger molecules with hydrocarbon chains. So therefore, that hydrocarbon chain is going to make it nonpolar. Um, there is some subtle differences with regards to lipids that we're going to focus on as we move through this lesson uh, that makes it quite fascinating and quite interesting in terms of its function that it can uh, carry out. But we'll, we'll cover those as we go through. Uh, so the cool thing about the function of lipids is that it is a huge major component of cellular membranes. As we get through cellular membranes and membranes of uh, individual organelles within the cell, you'll start to see just why that lipid molecule is so crucial and so important to the structures uh, within biology because it's allowing for the formation of cellular membranes to separate water pockets from another. It's like it's huge evolutionary milestone uh, that allowed for us to have these, these structures within us. So I, I'm quite fascinated and I find it quite interesting and pretty cool. So uh, I'm going to get a little excited as we move through this lesson. It's, it's super neat. Um, energy storage is a huge other component with regards to lipids. Uh, it allows for large amounts of energy to be stored in, uh, for lack of a better word, fatty tissues, especially in mammals. Uh, it is used in the formation of hormones and it helps with vitamin absorption. So what are fatty acids? Uh, they consist of that carboxyl functional group as well as a single hydrocarbon chain. Okay, uh, the key thing that differentiates itself from those carbohydrates is they're usually going to be chain structures. And we'll talk about why that's so important again as we move through. Uh, living things always have four or more carbons in their fatty acid chain. Well, this app is going to be annoying. I'm trying something different and it's annoying me. Oh, well, um, where was I? Living things always have four or more carbon in the fatty acid chain. And most times there's anywhere from 14 to 22 carbons in that carbon chain. And that long chain of carbons helps with, gives it that special structure and properties that I'm going to talk about as we move through. So again, the key thing here uh, is that functional group can lose that, that hydrogen ion and it can become polarly charged. And once it's lost, it, it turns into what's called an acid. So that carboxylic acid, which we'll talk about as we move through as well. So the presence of the carboxyl group gives it its acidic properties. Uh, as the length of hydrocarbon chains increase, the fatty acid becomes increasingly hydrophobic. And as a result of that hydrophobic, it is not soluble in water. Or sorry, it is soluble in water because that hydrophobic nature with regards to that structure combined with it all, the water molecules will have a very strong attraction to itself rather than the hydrocarbon. So it will be able to form that um, that, uh, that water saturation sheath around that hydrophobic component. So that less soluble aspect is so, so important because again, as I talked about earlier, it's allowing for the separation of water uh, groupings as a result of that cellular membrane being able to kind of be away from that hydrophobic part of that fatty acid chain. So Let's take a look at the difference between saturated and unsaturated fatty acids because that difference will help us to determine their structural components and why they can perform better at certain duties. So the most important thing that you need to realize is that these terms refer to the saturation of carbons with hydrogen atoms. So the more hydrogen atoms there are, we're going to consider that the saturated fatty acid. So the maximum number of hydrogen atoms are around each of the possible carbons. So each of those carbons is forming a single bond with another carbon, as well as three hydrogens or two hydrogens in the case of the internal carbons. So there's the maximum saturated number of hydrogen atoms in a saturated fatty acid. So that's a good, quick and easy way to remember how to differentiate between saturated and unsaturated. It's that max number of hydrogens possible are in that saturated fatty acid. Likewise, in an unsaturated fatty acid, there are less hydrogens than what are possible. And that's as a result of double bonds. And then those double bonds are going to form 
structural differences that allow for many, many, many different things to happen. Uh, when we think about the Van der Waals uh, forces that are possible, um, thinking about in terms of less or more, those unsaturated fatty acids can go through more Van der Waals uh, reactions or Van der Waals attractions, whereas that saturated less so. So again, that's, that's quite important in terms of, of what we'll need in this class, the idea of saturated versus unsaturated. Uh, again, that saturated, that max number of hydrogen, unsaturated has less hydrogens in it, more double bonds. Okay, so let's compare and contrast saturated versus unsaturated. The first thing, saturated is going to be linear. It's going to have that straight chain, that hydrocarbon straight chain as a result of no double bonds, which means no van der Waal forces interacting and changing the structure. It's only going to have single bonds between those carbons. There's no double bonds. There are no double bonds means saturated. Pretty straightforward. With regards to unsaturated, it's going to be nonlinear. There's going to have bends in those chains as a result of those van der Waal forces. And it's going to have at least one double or even some triple bonds between carbons, depending on where those carbons are. Uh, it can have mono, so when we call it a mono unsaturated fatty acid, it has one double bond, or a polyunsaturated fatty acid, it means it has more than one double bond. Both have carboxyl groups and a hydrocarbon chain. Both are going to still be acidic due to that carboxyl group, and both are still going to be hydrophobic and nonpolar. So that's a quick compare and contrast. Um, I may not have you answer a question specifically directly to compare and contrast, but you're definitely going to have to know the differences between the two of them. So I'll put a little star here for you, those of you who watch this later, or those of you who are taking notes now. It's quite crucial that you know the differentiate between the two of them. So what does this mean in terms of fats? Well, they contain what's called glycerol and, and one to three fatty acid chains bound together. These are the most common fats that we, we think about when we think about fats in, in our foods. Uh, we consider them triglycerides, uh, which have a glycerol head, and they're linked to three fatty acids. So when we talk about that glycerol, when we talk about those three fatty acids, that triglyceride, as well as an H2O molecule, is formed as a result of that linkaging. So when we think about it in terms of the length, or when we think about it in terms of how it's formed, um, again, just very similar to those carbohydrates where we're going to have that dehydration synthesis reaction take place to link that glycerol to those three fatty acids. Um, again, the similarities between fats and carbohydrates are always going to be there. I have the note that the, the, the chain of the hydrocarbon can vary in length. Uh, that's true, and it does have an impact on some of the structure, but ultimately it's not too big of a deal. Again, that ester bond being formed, uh, as a result of the dehydration synthesis. Uh, and again, I have that note there. The three fatty acid chains are usually different from one another. Okay, they're separate. So how do we look at, oops, how do we look at fatty acids in terms of like the everyday organisms? Um, we tend to think about different combinations of fatty acids in their triglycerides. So many of these organisms are our main source of dietary fats. Uh, so when we think about the different types of saturated, uh, monosaturated, polysaturated, what have you, those are going to be in terms of the structure, the fat structure of all of the different foods and all of the different uh, dietary sources of fat that we get. So it's very important to think about the saturated fats versus unsaturated fats versus trans versus monosaturated, um, it, it, taking that all into consideration. Uh, you can look at some of the characteristics of each of them as they are solid at room temperature with regards to saturated and, and trans fats. Uh, monosaturated versus polyunsaturated have some differences in terms of one is plant-based, one is uh, still uh, legume-based as well, but one also comes mainly from fish uh, in terms of where that is located. Uh, and then again, in terms of what is liquid and solid at room temperature, you can come back and harken back to the idea of how those van der Waal forces work, right? Those strong van der Waal forces make it solid at room temp, whereas those trans fats are unsaturated fats, um, and, and they're mainly solid at room temperature. 
So fats as an energy storage molecule. Uh, in biology, when we look at fats and how they are used to store energy, uh, they contain quite a bit of energy. Uh, so it's, it's almost twice as much as carbohydrates by weight. And so this makes fat very important for that energy storage aspect within our bodies. Um, but again, glucose is still going to be that preferred energy source uh, due to the nature that we can take those excess carbs and we can turn them into fat and then back into carbs when we need them again. So that storage of fats um, is quite good, but our body is super efficient at taking carbohydrates, utilizing those carbohydrates, and then turning it into fat if there's too much. And then when we need that excess energy, we can turn that fat back into carbs again. It's, it's very similar to the process that you see in animals that hibernate. They take on large, in large excess uh, aspects or amounts of carbohydrates that they then convert to fat through certain processes then they hibernate and as they're hibernating they digest those fats and they create carbs from those fats consume those carbohydrates again and again and again until hibernation is over and so bears that you see going into hibernation are in excess of 100 pounds heavier than when they come out of hibernation okay so let's take a look at phospholipids in terms of the structure of phospholipids versus those glycerols so this is where it gets interesting in terms of the biological processes because phospholipids consist of two fatty acids as well as a phosphate group and a glycerol. So well, as we looked at those glycerols, it just was the glycerol units up at the top head part. Here we have a phosphate group as well for those phospholipids. Uh, this key difference here is that it's going to have a polar and non-polar end. And I cannot stress, I cannot stress how important it is to recognize that that phospholipid is polar and non-polar in different parts. This is a very, very, very crucial component to the understanding of cellular membrane structures. Uh, that thing I was alluding to earlier in the lesson, this is the thing. So this is an example of what's called an amphitha amphithatic molecule. So what that means is that it contains a hydrophilic and hydrophobic region in one same molecule. Let that sink in for a second. It has a hydrophilic component as well as a hydrophobic component. So why that's so important, as I go through this, I'll, I'll talk about why it's, why it's so important, but the glycerol is able to bond three times. Uh, again, that same aspect to that glycerol uh, fat that we looked at earlier. But in, in phospholipids, one of the bonds uh, that it takes on is with a phosphate group instead of that third fatty acid. Okay, so if we were to look at these fatty acids here, a normal glycerol would bind with three fatty acids, but instead it's going to bond. Oh, I should do a different color here. Instead, it's going to form that third linkage with that phosphate group, and that changes the entire game. It changes everything. So phospholipids are extremely, extremely important components of the cell membrane, and we wouldn't exist without it, so to speak. None of those... Um, unicellular, multicellular organisms that evolved over a long period of time would have existed without this phospholipid uh, being a thing. Uh, the, the membrane is said to have a phospholipid bilayer. So outside the cell is extracellular fluid. This bilayer is as a result of the polar head region, right? That polar head region being hydrophilic and hydrophobic tails are gonna allow it to form this region that separates water from inside the cell to outside the cell. I cannot state how important and crucial this is to the underpinning of everything we're gonna learn in this class. Um, it's to me, one of the most beautiful aspects of biology, the thing that uh, allows for life to exist as a result of the organic chemistry components. This phospholipid bilayer that, that creates that cell membrane or cell wall, if you will, that separates water structures Ah, I, can't, I can't say how amazing it is enough. Uh, I will get misty-eyed the more I talk about it. But regardless, this concept as a whole allows us to study biology moving forward. So the last thing I want to talk about with regards to those fatty acids uh, is just some of the other aspects that it can take on and other roles it can take on. Uh, a steroid is an example of a lipid that contains four carbon rings. Uh, steroids are commonly going to be hydrophilic and hydrophobic um, because it's going to have different regions as well. So they are considered, again, that amphiphatic um, type of organ or molecule. It won't uh, have the same structure and importance 
as that phospholipid bilayer or that phospholipid as a whole. Uh, but again, it's, it's a type of hormone uh, and that can send messages and chemical signals throughout. So hormones are similar in structure, but have very, very different um, effects within the body. And it has to do with, again, that, that aspect of those functional groups that are attached to it. So some aspects that are, or some hormones that I'll talk about are testosterone and progesterone. Uh, as we move through the units, you'll start to see me talk more about hormones and how they take part in chemical messenger signals uh, as cells get other directions from other cells. But for now, just want to give you the, the bare bones idea that uh, they're made up of those lipids. Another important aspect is waxes. Uh, plant life needs those waxy cuticles to prevent water loss uh, from happening. And, and that water loss, as well as prevention from infection, kind of acts as like an immune system. Uh, so the key thing here with regards to any uh, living organism that utilizes wax, it, it helps with water loss as well as infection uh, for plant life. And then birds also use waxes to keep their feathers dry, uh, as well as bees making wax from their honeycombs. And the properties of waxes are, are quite neat. Uh, they're hydrophobic because they're nonpolar. Uh, they can be soft and quite flexible. And they also have a very low melting point. Okay, so that's it in terms of the lesson. I have a little summary and activity for you to perform uh, if you do want to take a look at it in a bit more detail. Um, ultimately, uh, I will do my best to answer any questions revolving around these two concepts. Um, do we need to remember the difference between triglyceride and phospholipid? Oh yeah, 100%. Uh, drawing the diagrams, no, but you need to be able to look at them and differentiate between the two of them if you were to see a phospholipid or a triglyceride. Yeah, you would definitely have to know the difference between them. But it's, it's quite simple, right? The phospholipid has that phosphorus group, and then the triglyceride doesn't have that phosphorus group. So anyways, uh, I'll continue to answer your questions as you have them. I'll stop recording here, and, and we can use the rest of this time to review and take a look at this material that we've covered.